Thank you. You may be seated. Memorial that paid the debt and made me free. What a wonderful work that our Lord Jesus Christ accomplished for us on Calvary's cross. There's the basis for true freedom. There's the basis for true liberty, and we must never forget. It was on the cross that he sealed our pardon, that he paid our debt, that he made us free. Oh, I hope that means as much to you as it does to me. Memorial Day. What mean these stones? We've just read a very interesting passage out of the book of Joshua, chapter 4. And we find in the last four verses, he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until ye were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which ye dried up from before us, until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty. And there's a second reason, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessings on this your word as it is proclaimed this day, that we go forth with power, with clarity, and the power of your Holy Spirit, to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you for the scripture, for it gives to us that which we must know, not merely for theological purposes, but for the way in which we live. Help us to understand why you have given us divine memorials, so that we might live and portray those memorials to a watching world. We pray for your blessings on this your word, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the history of Memorial Day here in the United States is very interesting. In the South they call it Decoration Day, when the graves of Civil War soldiers are decorated with flowers in their memory. In the United States, in these northern states originally, it was celebrated on May 30th in memory of soldiers killed in the Civil War and subsequently in later wars. Before the close of the Civil War, some southern states also took up the practice of celebrating May 30th. It was made official by the Commander-in-Chief John A. Logan of the Grand Army of the Republic, designating May 30th, 1868 for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion." End quote. It was first passed into law in Rhode Island in 1874, Vermont in 1876, New Hampshire in 1877. By 1950, it was recognized in all the states and territories except Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Texas. In Virginia, May 30th was regarded as a Confederate Memorial Day. In addition to the celebration of the National Memorial Day, Confederate Memorial Days are celebrated still in Louisiana, Tennessee, Arkansas, on June the 3rd, which is the birthday of Jefferson Davis, for those of you who are not from the South. Uh, he was the president of the Confederacy, if you don't even know that name. In Alabama, Florida, Georgia, and Mississippi on April 26th, and in North and South Carolina on May 10th. That's where we get our Memorial Day, which now encompasses all of the different wars in which the United States has been involved over the many years, and all of those who have died in the cause of freedom. It dates all the way back to the days of the Civil War, the war between the states, or as those in the South like to say, the late great disappointment. Memorial Day. It's important to our country because men, fathers, brothers, and in modern times, sometimes sisters and mothers have given their lives in the cause of defending freedom here in our country. And so we have human memorials. Human memorials are designed to remind the living about the dead for four different reasons. Number one, to keep us on guard. There is an enemy. Number two, to make sure that the lessons of the past are learned well. We must not forget. Number three, to keep us from repeating the mistakes of former generations. Don't go down this road. And number four, 
very important, especially as we get into the divine purposes of the memorials, is to give us a sense of continuity of our identity as a people. We have National Memorial Day because it gives us an identity as the people of the United States of America. But God has given to us some memorials to give us an identity as the people of God. Divine memorials have far deeper purposes and over the past several years we've looked at multiple passages of scripture that give to us at least 17 different purposes, I counted them out as we look back over the years, 17 purposes of the divine memorials. Let me just read them quickly for you to remind you. Divine memorials remind us about the character of God. Divine memorials remind us about the works of God. Divine memorials remind us about the law of God, his holy standards that define and condemn sin. Divine memorials remind us of the word of God. Divine memorials remind us of the holy service that we as God's holy people are obligated to, re to render. And we looked at those passages dealing with the service of the priest where God says that this is for a memorial. Divine memorials remind us that we have the right of access into the divine presence by the blood of Christ. Divine memorials remind us of the cost of redemption by the blood of Christ, which is typified by silver in the Old Testament. Divine memorials remind us of God's promise to regather Israel to the homeland in preparation for the return of Christ at the second coming. Divine memorials remind us of the typology of Christ as the bread of life and of his deity. Divine memorials show us that God will not accept unholy service or the service of the unbeliever. And much about the Old Testament sacrifices pointed to that. We looked at passages dealing with those things as memorials which were prohibitions against unbelievers offering sacrifice. Divine memorials remind us of our obligation to bring the best of our offerings to the Lord. Divine memorials remind us of the omnipotent power and mighty acts of God on behalf of his people. And that's where our text for today falls. Our text falls into that category of a memorial that reminds us of the omnipotent power and the mighty acts of God on behalf of his people. Divine memorials remind God's people that we are to be a separated people. Divine memorials remind God's people that he will destroy their enemies before them and protect them. And we have some offshoots of the text today that say the same thing. Divine memorials remind God's people that human memorials will perish, but divine memorials are everlasting. We spent some years in times past pondering cemeteries and gravestones. And who remembers anything about most of these people? Realistically, when you die, in this world, you will soon be forgotten. And the lesson we learned from that is, do something that counts for eternity. That's what will be remembered in eternity. Walk through a cemetery. Most people in that cemetery are totally forgotten by everyone. Maybe one generation remembered them, but now they are forgotten. You know, it's very painful for me to think of that at this moment. Do something that counts for eternity. Divine memorials remind God's people that the Lord himself, and he says so, that the Lord himself is our memorial. We've been given a special divine memorial which we celebrate together next week, the Lord's table. That's a divine memorial. God wanted Israel in our text today to remember, that is to establish a memorial, to remember the crossing of the Jordan River. I think that's rather significant because we might think that God would be much more concerned that they would forget the crossing of the Red Sea. He does mention that in our text in one of the 24 verses where he parallels it with the crossing of the Jordan River. But that was really a big event, 
I mean, that's really a long distance. That's 118 miles wide at the point where Israel crossed the Red Sea out of Egypt. The Jordan River is not that wide. So why would God be emphasizing in a whole chapter, think of that, a whole chapter of the Bible is given to this, setting the crossing of the Jordan River up as a divine memorial. There are memorial stones taken out of the riverbed and placed on the shore. There are stones from the shore that are taken off the shore and placed back in the bed of the river. And God gives some reasons why he wanted it to be done. You see, the Jordan River is a lot closer to where the people were going to live than the Red Sea was. This would be something that would not be out of their mind. It would be there and visible and available for them to see. Crossing the Red Sea, they would have to go all the way down into the Saudi Arabian Peninsula or all the way down into the land of Egypt, 480 miles south of the Delta. But this was going to be a, a memorial that they could see a memorial that they could take their children to, a memorial where the children might be playing along the banks and say, Dad, what do these stones here mean? Because they're obviously set up in a very special way. And the fathers could point to the stones and tell their children what God had done. At the Red Sea, God forged Israel into a nation. The prelude to the Red Sea, as you know, was the Passover, one of the most important feasts in the history of Israel. God indeed wanted Israel to remember the Passover, the Red Sea crossing out of Egypt, the destruction of Pharaoh and his army. Because the Bible tells us that the Passover is a picture of Christ, our Passover lamb. The crossing of the Red Sea is a picture of the complete and total salvation that God gives to us as he delivers us. The destruction of Pharaoh and his army is the permanent victory of Christ over Satan and his demonic host. But God also wanted Israel to remember the crossing of the Jordan River. That's what our text is about today. When Israel crossed the Jordan, we also have a memorial and a picture of things to come. But it's not a memorial of what heaven will be like. Too many of our hymns and gospel songs portray the crossing of the Jordan into the promised land as though it was a picture of entrance into heaven. No, that's not the picture. When Israel crossed the Jordan River, they entered into warfare, extensive, extended warfare with multiple enemies. There were giants in the land. There were pagans and idolatry in the land. There are not going to be any of that in heaven. There were seducers in the land. There were Philistines and Canaanites and Hittites and Hivites and Amorites and Ammonites, Jebusites and Girgashites in the land. Joshua 24 verse 11 lists the seven main nations that occupied the land when Israel came in to conquer. And ye went over Jordan and came unto Jericho and the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites, the Hivites and the Jebusites and I delivered them into your hand. Crossing the Jordan is the picture and symbol of entering into the victorious Christian life, not the entrance into heaven. We will not have to do battle in heaven before the wedding feast of the Lamb. We will not have to do battle in heaven before entrance into eternal bliss. We will join our Lord as he does battle back on earth at the second coming, when he destroys the armies of the Antichrist. But it is Christ, not us, that destroys those armies with the word of his mouth. No, crossing the Jordan is the picture of entrance into the victorious Christian life, empowered by the Spirit of God, overcoming the enemy by faith and obedience to the commands of our Lord. Now, many of us are still back in that picture of the wilderness wanderings. The, the times of disobedience, the times of carnality, the times of not walking by faith, the times of rebellion and stubbornness and disobedience. And there are Christians who are still walking in the wilderness. And there will be Christians who die in the wilderness even as the entire adult population that came out of Egypt, except for Joshua and Caleb, the entire adult population which refused to enter the land, who tempted God ten times, died in the wilderness. God wanted Israel to remember that it was God 
and God alone who gives the victory in spiritual warfare. That, I think, is a principal lesson that God wants us to remember from that crossing of the Jordan. Like Israel, we're involved in warfare, but it's a spiritual war. God has brought us up out of our Egypt. That's the picture of our salvation. Through the wilderness wanderings, that's the picture of our failure to walk by faith and the resulting loss. God has brought us through the cross the Jordan, which is a picture of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, a picture of presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice for the service of Christ. Paul writes, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's the victorious Christian life. He explains back in chapter 6 how to go about it day by day, yielding each member of your body to Christ. And you've heard me preach extended messages on that. But it is a spiritual warfare. And then we move into the land of spiritual victory for which God has made all of the provisions. Paul says so in Ephesians 6. God has provided for us what we need. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's Satan and his demonic hosts. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Let's look back for a moment at that passage and see the specific actions that God commanded and the specific visible object lessons that God provided so that the Jews who crossed the Jordan would be able to pass that memory to the next generation. First, there were 12 men who came from each of the 12 tribes, one from each tribe. I think the lesson that we learned from this is that it was the entire people of God to whom that lesson was to be passed, not just some. Not just the guys in seminary, not just the guys who've gone to Bible college. We have a man from each tribe who is responsible for a stone from his tribe. That tribe could say one of those stones is a stone that a man from our tribe laid on the surface of the ground or laid in the bottom of the Jordan River. It covered all 12 tribes. Number two, there were specific stones. Did you note that? They were to come from a specific location. It was to be the stones where the feet of the priests stood. The priest could also say, our feet touched these stones. These stones that you kids can see here on the banks of the Jordan River, our feet touched these stones in the dry riverbed as the water packed up and built higher and higher and higher and the children of Israel came across all the way back up to Abel which is a town not, I'm not referring to Abel in uh, the book of Genesis our feet touch these stones dear friends your feet have touched some stones too some important touchstones in the Christian life and you are priests unto God and to the Lord Jesus Christ we had no longer have an earthly priesthood which has to offer sacrifices if you've trusted Christ as your personal Savior you are a priest who can come in directly into the presence of God through the blood of Christ number three 
these stones were carried out of the riverbed to the place where the tribes camped. They were brought into their very midst. Everyone could see them. Everyone could walk by them. Everyone could touch them. Stones of memorial where they were living at that time. What stones of memorial do you have in your home? Or is your home polluted with the idols of the world? Do you have the hidden teraphim? The things that you hide in your saddlebags? Pagan objects in your home that were once used perhaps for demon worship or maybe even still are in places as you have those same little idols brought into the place where the tribes camped. Number four, these stones were designed to teach children. Oh, friends, what do you have that you are using to teach children? To teach children who had not seen the mighty works of God, children who might yet experience the mighty works of God as they went to battle, as they went through the land, as they saw God conquering the foes in various exciting ways, like the fall of the walls of Jericho, or when the sun stood still. But these would be stones that we remembered and could be, be gone back to and touched. that this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come what mean ye by these stones then ye shall answer that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when we passed over Jordan the waters of Jordan were cut off and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever that's back in verses 6 and 7 the verses I read just a moment ago were from the end of the chapter twice in the chapter at the beginning of the chapter and at the end of the chapter it is emphasized these stones are a memorial to teach your children memorial forever notice something also the 12 stones from the ground where they camped were to be placed as an underwater marker in the Jordan the stones from Jordan might be moved that were carried up on the bank, but the underwater stones would not present a temptation for someone trying to move them or build a house or to vandalize them or move them for some other purpose. The text, in fact, says in verse 9 that those underwater marker stones, quote, and they are there unto this day. I know somebody probably wants to go look for them, but uh, I suspect you won't find them. As the priests lifted their feet out of the Jordan, quote, the waters of Jordan returned unto their place and flowed over all his banks as they did before. They put the stones. Joshua told the priests to step out. As soon as they touched the dry ground, the water covered those stones. But they're there. And then God again tells the purpose of both the land-based and the underwater markers in verses 21 through 24. For the Lord your God dried up the water of Jordan from before you until you were passed over as the Lord did to the Red Sea. He parallels the two, which means that they're just as important, the one as the other, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over. God did this kind of a miracle twice in the history of Israel for an emphasis that he is the God who controls heaven and earth. Though the people, listen to this, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord. God gives divine memorials to his people so that all the people of the earth, as those divine memorials are established in and among us, will know that there is a God who rules heaven and earth. That all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty. But there's a second purpose that's given, that ye might fear the Lord, your God, forever. You know what happens when we forget the divine memorials? Do you know what happens in the next generation? Do you know what happens to our children and our grandchildren when we fail to remind them of the divine memorials that God has given to us and explain what mean ye by these stones? They forget. 
God gave us the memorials that you might fear the Lord your God forever. Divine memorials always point to God, and divine memorials always give God the glory. So what things does God want for us to keep in our memory, and how does he tell us to do it? Different groups of people have things that are passed from generation to generation so that the memory of those things will never be lost. And you know, in every case, they have an organized and very specific means of keeping the memory of those things alive. What means has God given to you as parents and grandparents so that you can keep these absolutely essential le lessons alive in the next generation? Let me give you an example first so that you can see how others around the world, different groups, have kept those memories of things alive. For example, throughout the time that Israel was dispersed among the nations, they kept in mind Jerusalem. Every Passover they would say, next year in Jerusalem. Today the Israeli Defense Force has an induction ceremony at the top of Masada. And the new troops are sworn in with a chant, Never again, Masada. They bring them back to that route. They take them to a place that was destroyed, but was defended bravely by 900 Jews against thousands of Romans who had camped around the base. The Jews have also kept the memory of Hitler's Holocaust alive by building Yad Vashem, which is a memorial in Jerusalem with thousands of photographs, documents, records, dioramas, and other forms of memorials in the gardens, the statuary, and the horrifying items from the concentration camp. It will make you weep as you go through. You can't imagine the brutality of one man against another. Now, there are certain things that God has given to the Christian believer to keep in mind, to remember so that we will be both doctrinally articulate and live a life that is pleasing to God. In the human realm we remember the past so that we will not be doomed to repeat it. The Bible exhorts us to remember the eternal Word of God so that we can serve God in time present and then throughout all of eternity. Titus 1.9 says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Paul reminds Timothy that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. What are we to hold on to? We are to hold on to the word of God. We are to remember what we have been taught from the scriptures. The following phrase in this passage tells us what results from holding on to the scriptures as we've been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine. There's only one source of sound doctrine, the Bible. If you forget what the Bible says, you'll soon wander into false doctrine. Anything that deviates from the Bible is false doctrine. Never forget that. If I say something that deviates from the Bible, it's false doctrine. If Martin Luther said something that deviates from the Bible, it's false doctrine. If John Wesley said something that deviates from the Bible, it's false doctrine. If Charles Haddon Spurgeon said something that deviates from the Bible, it's false doctrine. And yes, folks, even if Calvin said something that deviates from the Bible, it's false doctrine. Do you understand how serious it is to teach false doctrine? Do you realize how strictly accountable we who teach the Bible will be held to that standard? God is no respecter of persons. Be like the Berean Christians in Acts 17 who tested everything by the scriptures. They even tested Paul that way. Acts 17 verse 10, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women which were Greeks and of the men not a few. They were checking Paul out by the Bible. Do that with this preacher too. 
If I teach you something that's not biblically based, call me on the carpet for it. There's a divine purpose in well-memorized scripture. It says you must hold fast the faithful word, not hold fast the catechism or hold fast the confession. Both of those are secondary sources. Memorize the scripture. That is the sword of the spirit. We read it a moment ago in Ephesians chapter 6. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You can't fight the enemy without it. It's the scripture that gives you sound doctrine. Hold fast is the Greek word antekomai, which means to adhere to something, to stick to it like glue, to cling tenaciously. Make it a part of your life. Weave it into your being. Glue it to your brain so that you can function on automatic Bible pilot, if you will, when things get chaotic, chaotic and the enemy is shooting at your plane. Hold fast the faithful word. It's a faithful word. It will never fail you in times of crisis or in times of debate against the gainsayers. Oh, there are many things the Bible tells us that we must remember. That's why you go there, because it tells you the specifics of what you are to remember. Here we are on Memorial Day, a day to remember the goodness of God. Psalm 145, 7, They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. Memorial Day, a day to remember our great salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, 2, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Memorial Day, a day to remember the Bible's warnings against apostasy, Acts 20, 31. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Memorial Day, a day to remember practical Christian charity, Acts 20, 35. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Memorial Day, a day to remember the pit from which we were rescued, Ephesians 2.11. Wherefore, remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh, made by hands. Memorial Day. A time and a day to remember the prophetic teaching of Paul concerning the sign of the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians 2.5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Memorial Day, a day to remember the resurrection of Christ. 2 Timothy 2.8 Remember Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Memorial Day, a day to remember the words of the apostles concerning apostasy. Jude 1, 17. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Memorial Day. A day to remember God's original work in our midst and to repent, to avoid impending chastening. Jesus says to the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2, 5, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent so what is the cost of failing to hold fast and keep in memory the scriptures that we've received and heard Revelation 3.3 3. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. That warning was to the church at Sardis, a church much like our church today. 
And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches, not merely to Sardis, to the churches. Memorial Day, a day of memory, a day when Christians should remember the Word of God, a day when Christians must remember the Word of God as the only source of true doctrine and the faithful Christian life, the victorious Christian life. A day when the Christian must remember that we're involved in spiritual warfare. A day to remember that we have crossed the Jordan spiritually and entered into that warfare of the victorious Christian life by faith, with the armor of God. Remember especially the final promise over death. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We pray that you will help us never to forget, but to remember that we would hide the word of God in our hearts, that we might not sin against thee. But not only that we might remember, but that we might give it to our children, that we might point to these stones and say, this is what God has done. This is who God is. O oh, Father, that your word might be precious to us, that we might always keep it in our hearts and minds, that we might be transformed by the word of God. If we've not done it, if we've not yet gotten out of the wilderness wanderings of carnality and sin and selfishness and self-centeredness, Father, help us to present our bodies a living sacrifice, a once and for all sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto you, which is our reasonable service. It's not out of the ordinary to require it. It's our reasonable service. And Father, help us not to be conformed to the world. Make us transformed with the renewing of our minds that we might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then day by day to yield our members as instruments of righteousness, not instruments of wickedness and sin and carnality and all the things that we are so tempted to do because of that old sin nature. We're in a warfare, but by faith, by the power of the Spirit, by the grace of God and obedience to the Word of God, it can be a victorious Christian life as we enter into the land where there are giants, where there are enemies, where there are the seven nations of the pagans. And Father, by your strength, rejoice to do victorious battle as our great Commander-in-Chief leads us through the Word of God. We commit this to you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning.